Coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. I bought me a kayak, started fishing about the same time these trails were developed, started exploring out here, and then got the idea that I could guide people into these areas. They build their nest out of ash juniper bark, and they've evolved over the thousands of years this relationship with the tree. It keeps you in shape. It's a wonderful place to come, very relaxing, and it gives me a great start to the day. Texas Parks and Wildlife, a television series for all outdoors. This series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchase of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $40 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks, Guts, Glory, Ram. It's a great place to paddle. It's absolutely beautiful. It is a great surprise to me that you're able to do this 10 minutes before I live. Kayaking in the state of Texas has exploded. So we've tagged on to that. All right! <laughs> Kayaking and canoeing are more popular than ever. And now here in Texas, there's a push for more and more paddling trails. We're trying to develop a large inventory of paddling trails with lots of different venues so that we can reach a wide audience with a healthy outdoor experience. And this is just the Birch Creek. Birch Creek State Park boat ramp. Boat ramp. Yes, sir. Ron Smith We're from the paddling there. planning team. And you got wildlife life viewing. Is here as Lake Somerville State Park looks to open up their own paddling trail. Part of the process for today is that we're going to be looking at the initial survey. And so we're going to get our initial GPS and GIS information. Bathrooms? On site. Evaluate the put-ins and the takeouts. Look at the aids to navigation and the hazards to navigation. One concern on the lake is an invasive aquatic plant called hydrilla that could make paddling pretty tough. Well, what we're going to mention about this spot is that there is a fairly heavy hydrilla population here in this area, so we'll have to make sure that people are aware. It's part of what's here and part of the paddling trail adventure. Each paddling trail adventure starts at a public put-in with easy access, and signs provide trip details. Let's go easy, easy. In Houston, the Buffalo Bayou paddling trail meanders right through the heart of the city. We need to go left here a little bit. Bob Arthur is a river rat from way back. I think I missed everything. He's been paddling this <laughs> bayou for 30 years now. It's, I think, still the longest paddle trail in the state. Uh, 26 miles and all of it within the, the city limits of, of Houston, Texas. Oh, there's a log here. It's more natural than what I thought, let, let me say it that way. It's more natural than what I expected, you know, so you really feel like, you know, you're in the middle of nowhere. It's close. Just uh, get in and, and go. You spend two or three hours in nature. If you listen, it's just quiet. You can't hear anything but uh, what's supposed to be here. Uh -huh. The first official Texas paddling trail was Lighthouse Lakes, established in 1999 down along the coast at Aransas Pass. Well, what we have is an endless maze of creeks and lakes. 
Dean Thomas is a local guide who's been paddling these coastal channels since the trails opened up. I bought me a kayak, started fishing about the same time these trails were developed, started exploring out here, and then got the idea that I could guide people into these areas. It's very secluded, it's very peaceful. Um, a lot of these lakes are kayak only. It's just so shallow and so rocky in a lot of places. The only way to get through is a kayak. The trail is actually a series of four loops. They range from one to seven miles in length. The Lighthouse Lakes trails are marked with trail markers and with moderate paddling, you can do a very adventurous trip. There's sightseeing at the historic lighthouse. All the paddling trails that you could launch from the road lead out here to the lighthouse. Sight in some colorful coastal birds. We have every species on the coast. Or you can sight cast for some trophy redfish. The red fishing is world class in this area. Um, we have anglers traveling from all over the country. How you like that? About 23, 24 incher. Nice little red from Lighthouse Lakes. Fishing here might be world class, but the silence and solitude is the true draw. Once people come out and they spend a day in their kayak, they realize there's a whole lot more to it than just fishing. There's many days when I'm out here and I will sit back and put the rod in the holder and just enjoy the beauty of the place. Back on Lake Somerville, Ron and the site survey team have finally made their way to the highlight of the trip, the lake's main tributary, Yewa Creek. How long do y'all propose this trail will be? From our put-in spot to where the creek flows into the lake, it's about six miles. That's a nice length for one of our trails. It is. What's really nice about the Yewa Creek this time of year is with all the hardwoods we have on the banks. It drops all the leaves in the fall, and just, you can see they're just all floating right here, all those autumn colors. I think people are gonna be pleasantly surprised at this stretch of the Yewa Creek. The habitat is pretty pristine. Um, we have a lot of bottomland hardwood forests. They're just really beautiful, and people are gonna like it. It's a very unique venue for paddling. And, and that's our goal, is to create as many trails with as much uniqueness as we can throughout the state. Truly unique and one of the jewels of the paddling trail system is the upper Guadalupe River between San Antonio and Austin. This section of the Guadalupe River is very peaceful. You don't see a lot of development along here. I think we're the first ones on the river today. You just hear birds and the sound of your paddle going through the water. Margaret Stambaugh, her kids, and friend Cliff Gossett get their paddles wet here on the Guadalupe every chance they get. This particular stretch of this river is one of those stretches that you can use it as a starter, and when you get really good, you can still enjoy it. <laughs> and that's why I still enjoy it, because it's close. It's clean, it's clear. Wazooka! And the kids just love it. Woohoo! Mm -hmm. I personally like rippers with white water on them. It's just more fun for me. And so I do like the Guadalupe because it's close to Austin, and yet it has some fun stretches to, to challenge you a bit, but not too much. Wow, buddy. Aha. You gotta go through that hole. Okay. It will test you Whoa. to get through it clean. Right down this tube. Right here. And that's something that the kids that don't have this opportunity will never know. Yeah, we're good. This new push for paddling trails gets folks out on the water and respects the nearby landowners at the same time. So much of the river along the banks is private property, and it can be very tricky finding places to get in and out. So I think it's wonderful that there's some established places. The rivers are owned by the people, and what the public access does, it allows you to come down. It's public, 
You can stay, you can uh, come and go as you please, and any time you please. And the river is yours. Biologists Bill Reiner and Jim O'Donnell are looking for a tiny little bird. The nest is in the juniper tree, and it's about six meters off the tree, and uh, she's sitting on the nest right now. They are studying an endangered bird that nests only here in the hill country of central Texas. This is pretty typical of their habitat. Uh, they like a more closed forest environment rather than an open, mixed prairie woodland. This is the bird. It's a tiny warbler, the golden-cheeked warbler. And it's pretty special around these parts. Golden-cheeked warblers are unique in the sense that they nest nowhere else in the world but in central Texas. There's no other bird in the world that you can say that about, but golden cheek warblers, everyone is a native Texan because everyone was born here. Here in the rolling hills of central Texas is the Balcones Canyonlands Preserve. It's a 30,000 acre preserve right in the middle of a continually growing city of Austin. And this preserve is where Bill and Jim monitor these rare warblers. Uh, I found the nest two days ago. There's a female golden cheek warbler. The female does all the building. Uh, she uses primarily the bark of ash juniper trees for the structure of the nest. And then she binds it together with sticky materials like uh, spider webbing. It turns out these unique birds only nest here because they are dependent upon hill country ash juniper or commonly known as cedar trees. The golden cheek warbler is only going to breed in this particular habitat. They build their nest out of ash juniper bark, and they've evolved over the thousands of years this relationship with the tree. Herein lies the struggle. Some consider native Texas junipers a weed when they invade pastures and outcompete grasses and wildflowers. And like the warbler, people need places to live as well. A lot of the forest areas that used to house golden cheek warblers are now housing human beings. So much of the reason for the species being listed as endangered has been because of changes that we've made to the landscape. Got to find a good rock. To get an idea on population numbers. And this mist net's six meters long. The duo teams up to catch some. It's almost invisible. We've actually caught people who aren't paying close attention and walking close to the net. We try to find habitat where we have a narrow opening in which we can have the birds come down to a low perch as where they're going to want to cross back and forth. He's moving around a lot. We're going to entice him down with the song. Yeah, he's trying very hard to figure out where this rival is. Ah, close. He sounds agitated now. Got him. And it's always important to see which side he came in on. Well, you managed to get your head twisted in there pretty good, didn't you, buddy? All right. Let's put the bands on. His right leg now has an orange band over a silver band. One of the things that banding helps us with is longevity studies. So it's mauve over dark green, orange over silver. And what we're finding is some of the older growth habitat, closed canopy habitat, seems to be some of the favorite habitat for these guys. Oh, you're a feisty little critter. It's really good to see them yeah. snap because that means that he's very alert, he's still in good shape, and then just let him fly off. Whoosh. They've noticed the thicker and more remote the cedar forest, the better the chance of survival for the nestlings. Because there's higher densities of predators at the urban edge, that's much more dangerous environment for the endangered golden cheek warbler. Um, in the past, we've had a researcher who has been able to put cameras on nests and was actually taken film, and she was able to catch certain predators at the nest. One of the warbler's predators is the Texas rat snake. 
You know, we watch these nests uh, from the beginning. We, you know, see them go through the egg laying process, the nestling process, and many times just before they fledge, uh, we'll lose them. It's a tough thing to watch because, you know, we've gotten to know these birds over a long period of time. Many nestlings do survive. Jim is back to see if that female he spotted earlier has produced any chicks. We're gonna be checking on this golden chick nest. It's been about seven days since we've been here. So we're gonna check to make sure that they, the nest is still active. The female's coming in and she's got a caterpillar. Caterpillars are wonderful protein sources this time of year. This mom's been busy with three new chicks that are seven days old. Male's coming in now. He's been banded. He was banded two years ago. The future of the golden-cheeked warbler is dependent on prime nesting habitat. Preservation of these hill country cedar forests is the key. Before these warblers disappear altogether. One of the great things about the Balcones Canyonland Preserve is it's now coming back that we have trees here that are over 100 years old. We're setting the stage here for the return of those old growth forests. Golden Cheek Warbler is continuing to face pressures from urban growth from changes that we are doing to its habitat and to the planet. We hope with the establishment of the Bakunis Canyonlands Preserve, putting this land in some protection, that we can help them to survive into the future. The view, the view here is so beautiful. It looks like you're really looking over the ocean because of the topography. Just a neat place to come. It's the highlight of Big Spring, pretty much. A half hour east of Midland is the West Texas town of Big Spring. This was the only watering hole for 60 miles in either direction, so it was an important spot. The historic spring once drew Indians, the stagecoach, and railroad. The pioneers that came through here would leave their mark. We have one 1888 on up to 1917 and past that. Today, travelers are still drawn to the mountain on the edge of town, preserved since the 1930s as Big Spring State Park. We're right on the edge of the Edwards Plateau, so it's a 200-foot bluff drops down to the level of the city of Big Spring here. To the north, we're looking at the southern high plains all the way up into the Panhandle. About six miles east of the bluff here is the rolling plain. So you have three ecological regions merge right here in the Big Spring State Park. It makes me happy. <laughs> it keeps you in shape. It's a wonderful place to come, very relaxing, and it gives me a great start to the day. Very good place to come work out, <laughs> especially in the evening, very pretty. While the vistas offer natural grandeur, the park's roads and buildings, crafted by the Civilian Conservation Corps, also have a timeless beauty. Amazing work, all of it. The CCC structures have weathered the elements gracefully for over 75 years. We've had to do very little maintenance to the buildings, and these buildings have been here since 1934, so that gives you an idea of the heritage and the sturdiness of them. Well, it's kind of a historic place, but it's very pretty, and uh, it's a nice place to visit. It's relaxing to sit perched on the edge of the bluff, watch off in the distance and the view. The night vista with the twinkling lights, it's just neat to see those. 
watching the town, waking up. It looks so beautiful from here. Some come to take in the panorama, <laughs> others to take a walk or just take a break. <laughs> but every visitor seems to enjoy the view at Big Spring State Park. Nowhere else around that you can go and get a view like this. Great vantage point. Lytris aspirus, the large uh, cone flower, Vecchia maxima. That is a blazing star or Kansas gay feather. Lytris pinkness station. The average person might not know what they're looking at in this field. The gamma grass, they're in flower right now. But this guy <laughs> does. This is a wet prairie or, or Cajun prairie. Um, these coast, this type of coastal prairie is, is globally rare. Um, there's only um, less than basically less than 2,000 acres of this coastal prairie that remains. Call it a Cajun prairie or crawfish prairie because the prairie is a wet prairie and it has crawfish mounds around it. Jason Singhurst is one of two botanists for the state of Texas. He's responsible for creating and updating the rare plant community list for the Texas Conservation Action Plan. Uh, Gulf vervain. And with more than 5,000 species of plants in Texas, it's a big job that affects a lot of wildlife. The vegetation communities of Texas are key to understanding the habitats, and so without a good in a vegetative community, we don't really have things for the critters that we try to conserve. The coastal prairie ecosystem between Beaumont and Brownsville once encompassed six and a half million acres. But today, only about 140,000 acres remain. Jason would like to protect what's left with the help of the Houston's Coastal Prairie Partnership. Because this is a little island prairie surrounded by development, we really want to protect this site. And we also felt like it would put um, all these conservation groups in a position to really have a prairie in a suburban setting, which is next to an elementary school, get them to come out and enjoy and understand the ecology right in their backyard. It'll be really good to see what the prairie looks like. And his enthusiasm is spreading through volunteers he calls prairie hunters. Today, two volunteers are looking for a very rare orchid located near some railroad tracks. It's a globally rare plant. Um, called the Texas Lady Tresses orchid. It's an orchid species we haven't seen in, in the upper coast in about 30 years. It's such a treat to go out with Jason in the field because one, he knows so much. He's so eager to teach and share his knowledge. And it's so much fun when he gets excited about plants. Is that incredible? Passion flower bloom. Among his contributions, Jason has published over 90 articles on the plants of Texas. He's produced the largest data set on native prairies in America collected thousands of plants he's added to herbariums in Texas. He received the 2012 Prairie Preservation Award. He co-authored the book, Rare Plants of Texas, and discovered five endemic rare plants. Well, I think the one thing I'm most proud of is discoveries. This is uh, Rattlesnake Master. Actually found species that never been described and be able to publish on them. It makes me very happy. But there is one species he doesn't like. I don't like Chinese tallow. I don't want to hear this. Okay, it's one of the most aggressive, <laughs> invasive trees. Your life was surely right, but can't touch. Almost impossible to battle. All right, look up some guts and you get it. And he does have a life beyond the great outdoors. There are times where dad has to put his blinders on, that's for sure. I, I am a soccer coach, and my wife and I are involved with uh, the Girl Scouts. Yeah, I mean, he's, you know, really good at taxonomy. So, Lechia eucrinata. Eucrinata, yeah. Okay. Being able to look at a plant and tell you what its scientific name is. Lindheimer's bee balm. I think that he is really happy to be paid for the work he does. I think he really enjoys it. But, you know, I can't help but think that he knows that what he does is important. A lot of people at Parks and Wildlife do. But people like Jason have some pretty big victories, too. So, you know, you feel like you're actually having a real, very positive impact on conservation. So if you're looking for Jason Singhurst. Jason, where are you? Just look outside. The Lytris aspera. The, um, I was and listen. This is purry parsley. Of course, it's called basket flower. The inflorescence looks like a weaved basket.
This series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchase of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $40 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks. Guts. Glory. Ram.